Thank the gentleman for yielding. I now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stubbe, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just going to pick up where I left off. Uh, Mr. Pachai, there, there are rioting groups that are going unchecked with the posting of what I would contend is very violent video, yet yesterday I was sent a YouTube video about doctors discussing hydrochloroquine and discussing the not dangers of children returning to school. And when I clicked on the link, it was taken down. And then I was sent a different link on YouTube and it was taken down. I just checked again just to make sure. And it says that this video has been removed for violating YouTube's community guidelines. How can doctors giving their opinion on a drug that they think is effective for the treatment of COVID-19 and doctors who think it's appropriate for children to return back to school violate YouTube's community guidelines when all of these videos of violence is all posted on YouTube? Uh, Congressman, we, we believe in freedom of expression and there is a lot of debate on YouTube about uh, effective ways to deal with COVID. Uh, we allow robust debate but in the area during a pandemic, uh, we look to local health authorities. So for example, in the US, it would be CDC for guidelines around medical misinformation in a narrow way, which could cause harm in the real world. And, and so for example, if there is a, the aspects of a video and if it explicitly, explicitly states something could be a proven cure and that doesn't meet CDC guidelines, you know, we would. We, it's we it's would free expression of speech, and you have these doctors who are giving their opinion as doctors. And I don't understand why YouTube and therefore Google thinks it's appropriate to silence physicians and their opinion of what can help and cure people with COVID 19. I'm going to switch quickly to Mr. Zuckerberg. I think at this point it's fairly obvious that technology platforms have been stifling conservative news and opinions. You employ a panel of content moderators. Can you explain how? Facebook chooses who these moderators are. Uh, thanks, Congressman. We we do hire um, a, a lot of uh, people around the world to work on on safety and security. We our team is is more than thirty or thirty five thousand people working on that now. Um, we certainly try to do this in, in a way that that uh, is is neutral to all viewpoints. We want to be a platform for all ideas. I, I don't think you build a uh, a social product with the goal of giving people a voice if you don't believe that people being able to express a wide variety of things is ultimately valuable for the world. And we try to make sure that our policies and our operations uh, ultimately reflect and carry that out. Is there an ideological diversity amongst the content moderators? Uh, Congressman, I, I don't think we, we choose to hire them on the basis of an ideology. Um, they're they're hired all over the world. Um, there's certainly a, a, a bunch in in the U.S. They, they there's diversity in where they're hired, um, but certainly we we don't want to uh, have any any bias in in what we do, and we wouldn't tolerate it if we discovered that. So you don't specifically hire, say, conservative moderators and Democrat or liberal moderators, so that there's a balance in your content moderators. Congressman, in terms of the. 30 to 35,000 people or more at this point who are doing safety and security review, uh, that is correct. In terms of the people setting the policies, I think it is valuable to have people with a diversity of viewpoints involved so we can make sure that we have the different viewpoints uh, represented in the policy development process. And we also consult with uh, a number of outside groups whenever we, we develop new policies to make sure that we're taking into account all perspectives. What are some of those outside groups that would be conservative leaning? Uh, Congressman, I, I, I need to get back to you with a, with a list of specific uh, groups, but it would depend on what the topic is. Uh, yeah. That, that yeah, can you just about. can you just think of one? I mean, you said you you reach out to outside groups. Can you think of one conservative outside group that you reach out to and use as a content moderator? Uh, Congressman, uh, I'm, I'm talking about different external stakeholders and groups that are inputs to our, our policy development process. Uh, and I'm not involved in those conversations directly, so I would have to get back to you with, with specifics on that. But I'm quite confident that we 
uh, speak with people across the ideological spectrum when we're developing our policies. I would very much appreciate a follow up on that. Uh, real quickly, can you briefly explain the approval process for third party fact checkers and how many fact checkers does Facebook employ? Yes, thanks. Uh, we work with about 70 fact checking partners around the world. And the goal of the program is to limit the distribution of uh, viral hoaxes. So things that are, are clearly false uh, from, from getting a, a lot of distribution, but we don't ourselves want to be in the business of determining what is true and what is false. That feels like an inappropriate role for us to play. We rely on uh, an organization um, called the, the Pointer Institute, and it, I think it's called the, the Independent Fact-Checking Organization uh, that uh, has a set of guidelines of, of what makes an independent fact checker, uh, and they uh, certify those fact checkers, and then any organization that gets certification from that group is qualified to be uh, a fact-checking partner uh, within Facebook. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired.